Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, everyone, for actually being here today uh, to share my passion for marine electrical and electronics, of course, on boats. Um, we had a really good day yesterday, so for some of you that were here yesterday, you're going to have a little bit more insight in what we're talking about, but the feeling of being lost with electrical is commonplace to everyone all the time. So uh, yesterday, I was speaking with a few people after uh, the course and I think it's one of those things where marine electrical, and I can speak just for myself, I don't think I will ever truly know everything about anything. And so what it is, it's just a journey. It's not about getting to completion. It's about simply finding out and learning more about your boat. So at times, it's okay to feel like, yeah, I got this. Oh, I learned here. Oh, I, this, this doesn't make sense. When I read electrical systems, I'm also lost. And I'm like, okay, first time, it doesn't make too much sense. And then I read it again, maybe six months later, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then you figure it out, and then things start, because it's a concept, and it needs to kind of come together. And so the feeling of being overwhelmed um, with a boat in general, and electrical specifically, is normal. And that's just part of the fun. So um, <clears throat> I just want to emphasize that's what we're going to be talking about uh, overall today, and don't be too... Uh, disappointed if things don't all make sense right the first time. So today the topic is going to be electrical and electronics fundamentals and it's going to rela relay to what we're going to try to figure out is how do you troubleshoot those systems on your boat. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Before we get started, I want to emphasize please cell phones, if you can make sure they're on mute, that'd be great. Um, ask questions, I'm going to emphasize, and this is going to be a little bit, there's going to be more questions in this section because a lot of it is kind of figuring out what's going on. So feel free to lift your hand. If it's the right time, I'll tell you, or maybe I'll take it for later. Takes lots of notes. And then as I mentioned yesterday, all these slides are going to be actually provided online. So you're going to be able to access these resources later on. For the people that are joining us here today, a little bit about myself, wondering why I'm here talking to you about marine electrical. Is it because I own a boat or I've boated before? Um, I think it's a little bit more than that. Um, I've dedicated my life, really, it's, it's a full commitment, to marine electrical systems. That's all I do. 16 hours a day, I breathe, that's it. I'm, I'm a complete nut for making a boat systems reliable. And hopefully today you're going to see through that the passion that I have in, in actually converting reliability to having a good time on the water. So that when you're actually on the water, you're there to enjoy it. And you're not constantly dealing with the problems of having to figure out why your systems are failing and things don't work. <coughs> a big part of doing work on a boat is understanding that you don't want to do things on your own and do it your own way. There are codes out there, and I am a strong believer in actually doing things the right way the first time. And maybe you think you have a better way, but I would really question and ask everyone to really consider the code and to do things as the code uh, stipulates and to not invent their own way of doing marine electrical, which I find interesting every day uh, on boats. I see it all the time. But the code is a, probably a really good benchmark to how to approach marine electrical and electronic systems. All right, so a little bit about the company. Um, we're basically focused and we're, we're developing our expertise, specific yacht systems, through expertise through repetition. That's sort of my mantra. You only get good at something if you do it over and over again. So that's a big thing. Uh, we work here in the Lower Mainland and Sunshine Coast and Vancouver Island. So we have technicians in all those three areas. And a big part of our business now is actually doing design consultation services for boaters around the world. Um, that's probably about 20% of our business now, where people hire us to consult and provide plans or a sounding board. They're kind of dreaming about what they want to do with their boats. And they're like thinking, oh, well, how am I going to do this? I'm not sure. And they've, they've read a lot on blogs, but now they want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. And so we'll pair them, pair them up either with myself or some of my senior uh, engineers, and then they can start narrowing down their choices of what they're going to actually achieve with their boat or the improvements they're going to do on their boats. And to give you an idea, just last year alone, um, or this year, we did over 1,000 boats. Um, so that gives you kind of the breadth. 
And that's what I'm going to be trying to share to you today is sort of like, we can worry about a lot of things when we troubleshoot, but there are, you know, in terms of probabilities, more probable things that have failed when something's not working. So it's not about looking at everything. You start with the most probable and then you go down the list, right? And you get that experience or that knowledge by actually getting invited on boats all the time to fix a problem. And that's really what I'm going to be sharing about today. And if you're curious and you're still thirsty and you want to geek out and you want more information about mo boat electrical systems or electronics, um, I invite you to go to the website or our YouTube channel. We have a lot of other content related to what I'm talking about here today. So it's worth rehashing that when you work on electrical systems, there is a, it's not like building a table. There are certain elements of safety. And so you want to be a little bit cognizant of those safety factors, right? So electricity can cause fires. It's a real threat, and that's mostly how boat fires happen is through electricity, right? Or problems on the electrical systems. Work within your competence level. Don't just kind of like... And your competence level is something that's growing, right? Like I have, for example, this um, boater that I know has no technical background so whatsoever. None. He's an accountant, and he does tremendously good work. But he also educates himself, does everything himself. I've never worked on his boat. I just provide advice. And we're talking, and he gets it. But he's also very thirsty for knowledge. He's constantly educating himself, reading blogs, reading articles. And then when he does something, he does it well. So it's not about what your, you know, your past history is. If you have an interest in something, I think anyone can do very well in anything that they apply themselves to. And so work within your competence level means just don't simply go there and do it. Educate yourself, read about it, figure out, ask the pros, ask other boaters how they've done it, and then tackle the problem as opposed to just get in there and just try to hash it out. And then I'm reiterating about ABYC and MEA is very important. There are standards out there. Um, the codes are, well, there's two ways. There's E11 um, is ABYC. NMEA has, so let me talk about the codes. <clears throat> They're dry, right? So, for example, what you would do is you would need almost sort of like when you talk about law, you meet or talk to a lawyer that sort of brings in down to a simple way for you to understand. So like, so for example, when I was reading the codes prior to me getting into them, um, I was reading them through other authors. So authors would summarize the codes and make it in a way that I could easily understand, right? Because it, it, you need sort of a translator. Because when you read the code, this is not a novel, right? This is, this is far from it. It's very bullet driven, you know, it's, it's, it can be overwhelming. So what you do is you read from authors who are only doing work based on the codes, like someone like Nigel Calder, for example, right? And then he'll synthesize that information and present it to you in a way that is readily available. And he might even, this is what I try to do sometimes with voters, he might tell you the why. Because a lot of people, what I find is it's hard for people to just be told what to do. But if they understand why they're doing it, then they're more likely to do it. And it's the same thing that I do with our technicians on our team. I never tell them what to do. I tell them why we're doing something. And so long as you tell them why we're doing something, then the what normally follows. The problem is the code can't, doesn't have any background <coughs> to why they're telling you what they're telling you. And then you're seeing that, well, that's just stupid because you don't have context. And so that's the challenge with reading the code per se, is that there is no context to a code. They don't tell you any whys. It's do this. And so I would say that when, if you want to follow the code, the easy way to do it is read from really like Don Casey, uh, whoever. There's people that do really, really good work and are translating the code and making it accessible for everyday people. But if you want to dig in, ABYC E11 is a really good way. And NMEA has different standards. We'll talk about that. There's 0, 100, 200, 300, 400. Our technicians go through training, so these organizations will actually come down to Vancouver, or they'll come to the island, they'll come to Seattle. I remember when I did my electrical certification, I went down to Seattle for five days or four days. So then there's instructors that kind of bring that, but again, we're not studying from the book because the book is, it's just instructions, very 
hard to understand. You've got a book that actually synthesizes that information, puts it with context, and then you learn the code. <clears throat> the point that I always emphasize, um, and I try to live by, and our team does, and I, is to do it right. Don't make it work. On a boat, reliability is everything. You're going to depend on it. If something is there, you're going to assume it's going to be there when you need it. You want to remove as much variability on your boat and surprises. And by doing it right, doing it properly the first time, you're not going to be constantly disappointed with your boat's electrical systems or electronic systems where they're intermittent. And nothing is more bothersome than a problem that comes and goes. And if it doesn't bother you, I can guarantee you it will bother someone on your crew. There's going to be someone on that boat that will hate that something works sometimes and it doesn't work other times. So um, we're going to start the morning with two things. We're going to do a little bit on electrical fundamentals because that's going to help you for troubleshooting. And then we're going to dive in at a higher level on the electronics, talking about the what. And then we're going to dive into troubleshooting both of them probably in the afternoon. So I don't want to scare people here. Um, but we're just going to try to make sense because power or connectivity is really generally the issue with most devices. Meaning, besides a product failure, a lot of times the issues are connectivity problems between those devices on your boat. They're lacking power, they're not getting the information they need. Those connectivity issues relate to electrical fundamentals or networking. And we'll talk about networking a little bit later. So <clears throat> the water analogy is an incredibly great way to think or imagine what a volt is. Ultimately, it's about potential. And it's actually used interchangeably, right? What's the potential? And think about with a dam, the height of the water behind a dam determines how fast the turbine at the bottom of the dam is going to turn, right? The deeper you dive into a swimming pool, the more it hurts your eardrums. There's the weight of this water column above you is bigger and bigger the deeper you go. And so volts is simply about potential. And this slide demonstrates that something at 12 volts is going to have more potential power than at 1.5 volts. And think about 120 volts, right? So the higher the potential, the more power you can have, <clears throat> right, to move that turbine. So very similar to water pressure. It really is very, very similar. And when I think about batteries, and I think about batteries at different voltage levels, I'm literally thinking about batteries that are putting, put in parallel between different pools of water or tanks of water that are actually joined together. You know, what happens when you join two tanks of water that are uneven? Well, the pipe that's connecting the both is going to see an inrush of water to even the two tanks out, right? And so that is, happens with electricity. And if you think about that electricity is a little bit like water, then what it makes you realize is it's pretty deterministic, right? It's not that magical. Like if you have, you know, some places have pretty intricate, complicated plumbing. Like they've got things going everywhere. Are you thinking about maybe a refinery or a chemical processing plant? It's not just like the pipes in your home. It doesn't just, it's not that simple. Well, at the end of the day, it's pretty, it's not magic. If it's done right at the beginning, all, everything is properly interconnected and done like a pro, it's going to work. So the water analogy is a way to make yourself realize that this is not that hard. It really isn't. And um, it, it's good to think in those terms whenever you think about electricity. So we talked about voltage. The next thing you want to think about is, okay, well, what about, what's this thing about resistance? Like, why does resistance matter? Well, resistance in here is, think about if this is a pipe, what happens when you kink a pipe, right? And you think about even washing your deck on your boat and you don't have a nozzle, and you put your finger at the end of the nozzle, right? The water, 
because it's going through a smaller opening, it's going to come out faster, right? There's going to be a restriction, right? <clears throat> and so, again, a kink, right? So what would happen? So resistance is something that actually is going to affect and it's going to have an effect on voltage drop. And we'll talk about that. And it's very important. Because when you have a bad connection, and we see that, boats that even have partially sunk, or even think about, you know, in an engine room where maybe a water hose got undone from your impeller and sprayed salt water in the engine room, and the ensuing corrosion problems that you have in your engine room where things are now intermittent. You know, when that water spewing in the engine room, it might be going on the inverter, it might be going in different places, it might be going on the starter post, it might be going on the starter, uh, the alternator, and over time you have these complications where things aren't working well. Well, that's because now you have corrosion, and through corrosion you're going to have voltage drop. So, putting it through a small pipe is sort of like a small filament, right? It's changing the wire size. We talked yesterday, we saw the difference about running you know, amperage through a large wire and through a small wire. And a fuse is simply a, a device that at one point when you exceed the ability of filament, you exceed the amperage rating of that fuse, that wire filament is simply going to blow. It's going to melt so that you don't lose the wire itself, you just lose the fuse. So a light bulb has a filament. All right. <clears throat> So don't be scared. Current, which is known as I in the engineering world, is voltage over resistance. So amps is volts over amps, ohms, I mean. All right? So let's take an example here. If you've got a 12 volt battery, right, and you've got a 2 ohms resistance, how many amps are going to be flowing through that circuit? And I want to, it's funny, it took me a long time. I didn't even really get it in engineering. It's incredible. Like some concepts, they're almost like that Eureka moment where you're like, oh my God, I got it. The resistance here is the very thing that stops this circuit from being a short circuit. If you remove the light bulb from this circuit and you have nothing other than a wire, and a wire does have a resistance but very little, you're creating a short circuit. So it's, it's essential for all circuits to have a load. You can't simply connect a positive and negative wire together and not expect to have an ensuing fire because there's no way to limit the current going through the wire. The resistance, the load, is what actually limits the amount of current going through that cable or wire. So in, in this instance, you've got six amps going through that circuit, okay? You're never going to be doing those calculations on your boat. What you want to think about, and I see this commonly, that what the takeaway here is that every single piece of equipment, electrical equipment on your boat is essential to limit a dead short from the power supply. You cannot ever, ever, ever connect a positive and negative wire together without something in between that provides a limiting factor so that you don't have a dead short between positive and negative, okay? But I'm not seeing myself doing amp calculations when I'm troubleshooting. I'm using this as an example to remember that there is gonna be current going through a wire because that's gonna be really useful and I'm gonna show about that a little bit later on how you can see if a load is actually working or not. The other thing that is essential is going to be measuring voltage across two points. In this instance, it says finding battery voltage, but it could be any sort of voltage. It could be a voltage between A and B. And as you're troubleshooting, and sometimes, unfortunately, you might be in the middle of nowhere. You might be, you know, I've got calls from people all over the place, from the Browns, from really deep into Desolation Sound where they can have cell reception, but they just simply can't get a technician on board and they want to troubleshoot. And so that's where having a multimeter on board is absolutely crucial if you want to be self-reliant. It's easy if you're always in the city. If your boat never leaves the dock, 
and you can afford a technician, no problem, this doesn't apply to you. You'll just simply always call. The challenge is you might be able to and are willing to pay for a technician in the city, but what happens when you're in the middle of nowhere and you want to resolve this problem because you don't want to, either you don't want to end your vacation or this is actually such a big deal that it actually affects your vacation. You can't even come home until you resolve this problem. And that's why troubleshooting is essential. It's not that you can't throw money at it, is there's no way to throw money at it because there's no one around you that can help you other than yourself. And it comes back to this being the self-reliant. So what you'll end up doing is you'll want to be able to measure potential voltage. Another way that it's described is differential, right? What is the difference in volts between two points on a circuit? So here we're just demonstrating measuring voltage potential across a battery. What happens when you reverse the probes? Notice that before the positive was the top and now the negative. So the polarity is going to change, right? Between maybe if that battery's let's say 1.5 volt, it's going to be 1.5, negative 1.5, right? <clears throat> and then what happens, and this is pretty common, here we're just demonstrating a 1.5 battery, but how many boats have 6 volt golf carts? Pretty common, right? Wired in series, two batteries wired in series, and then have another two wired in series and another two, and then have them in parallel. And if you want to know if that battery, which battery has failed, you most likely, and this happens to boaters all summer long. Remember, failures are going to most likely happen when you're using your boat. They're not going to happen when you're not in your boat. And you're not going to know a failure probably until you use your boat. And how many of us use your boat at the dock? Not that many. So these problems unfortunately happen to us when we're on our own. You've got to figure this out. And I walk through this sort of testing with owners and boaters all the time. Okay, let's isolate the battery. You've got a battery bank. You've got eight batteries. Which battery has failed? Let's measure the voltage across every battery. Let's find the one that has a dead short. What's going to happen next? Let's start there. Once we figure that out, then we can isolate. But you do that by measuring, in this instance, the voltage potential between one end and the other and what voltage are you going to get? Right? You're going to get, in that instance, 3 volts, or if it was a golf cart battery, 2 in series, it'd be 12. Here's another instance. How many boaters have group 31s or 8Ds in parallel? Tons. I mean, I'm, every Sea Ray that is out there, instead of putting an 8D on board now, they're putting group 31s because A, they weight half as much. And they're putting the batteries in parallel because they still just need 12 volts on the smaller boats and they're putting two group 31s in parallel. So replace 1.5 volts with group 3112. And so when you wire and you measure the voltage potential across, you're still measuring 12 volts because they're not in series, now they're in parallel. The rule is this. When you add, there's two variables to a battery in terms of amp hour uh, characteristics. There's a lot, but let's, let's bring it down to two simple points. One is amp hours. Right? That's capacity. We talked about that yesterday. It's called the C20 rating. I'm not going to go into that, but that's what it is. So you buy a battery in capacity. Golf cart battery is about 220 amp hours. And then you're going to buy it in voltage. It's 6 volts. It's not really, but let's call it 6. <clears throat> when you add batteries in series, the amp hours stay the same and the volts keep adding. Pretty common now to see boats 24 volts. Right? So you'll have literally four golf cart batteries in series. Four golf cart batteries in series are going to be 24 volts with a 220 amp hour rating. So you can't, it's, there's no miracle. You can't add volts and amps. You either one or the other. Now, if you take, for example, an AD battery or a group 31 battery, group 31 battery is 120, 110 amp hours, and you start putting them in parallel, the volts stay the same but the amp hours keep increasing. That's how you get a larger battery bank. So four group 31s in parallel is 440 amp hours at 12 volts. The other thing that I think is really essential as a boater, if you want to be self-reliant, is to start drawing stuff out. And neatness is going to be key 
on your boat. I can't tell you how many boats I go into and I'm looking at the battery bank and after five minutes, I'm still not sure how everything is wired. It works, but our brains are looking for patterns. That's what it is. Chaos is natural, <coughs> but order isn't. And if you have order on your boat, electrically speaking, like things are done neatly, and that's why pros do it like that. It's not because they're crazy, they're OCD. It's because then you, if something's out of place, it will obviously stick out. In, Mechanics talk about this with cleanliness is godliness on an engine, right? They say how important it is to have your engine perfectly cleaned, everything about it. So if you ever see a little bit spot of oil, something looks out of place, your brain is going to spot the anomaly. If everything looks like chaos, you could stare at it for 20 minutes. You're not sure what's new, what was there before, and you're still staring at it. It doesn't make any sense. So for troubleshooting and looking at batteries, create a little schematic. When things are calm, when you don't have a problem, how are my batteries wired? So that when it comes down to it, you can either take a picture of it, send it to a technician, send it to a friend. Like, I've got a problem, where do I start? And that's the great thing about the boating community, right? Is that you can really rely, a lot of times I'll have boaters that are middle of nowhere stuck and I'm like, okay, you're in Desolation Sound, there's bound to be someone around you that's maybe more comfortable than you are if you're not. Go on a little tender ride and find someone that's willing to help. And oddly enough, I always get to talk to someone else, right? The owner, the primary owner might not be comfortable. It's above his pay grade. He's like, I can't, I just, I'm not comfortable. But then I'll be talking to someone else. Hi, Joe. Oh yeah. So if you've been on this boat, you don't know. No, but I'm here to help. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm a mechanic or I'm an engineer or yeah, I built my own boat or I've done this or I sailed around the world or whatever. Yeah. So tell me what should I do? And then we walk through it and this community helps and we can resolve problems with one another, even though I might not be there in person. But a diagram is going to make the job of whoever's working on your boat or helping you out much easier. So batteries in parallels, right? We got two 12 volt batteries, positive to positive, right? <clears throat> and negative to negative, right? So what happens to the volts? 12 volts, that's right. And what about the amp hours? 200, yeah. And that's how you get a larger battery bank, right? Like it's pretty rare that you're gonna have someone that's going to have one battery for the whole battery bank, right? And think about even a 12 volt battery is really six batteries in series because there's no such thing as a 12 volt cell. All the cells are 2.1 volts for a lead acid battery. So when you're buying a 12 volt battery, you're actually buying six batteries that are wired in series in that battery. Short circuits, it's sort of like lighting a match in a gasoline tank that is mostly empty, full of vapors. It's the end of the world, can never happen. It's game over. So there's no kind of like, hey, whatever, it's just fun. No. A, dead, a short circuit between a positive post on a 12 volt battery uh, we saw some videos yesterday is extremely significant and is in, and will be a life event on your boat You will never forget that day ever So what we do as boaters is we try to avoid having that right? Very 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 big and that's where all this safety craziness and people call me. Oh, you're just a fuse nut I'm like I'm a fuse nut. I'm like do you wire everything in your home right hot? Do you have three nails on the wall that's it, your circuit panel, you like to the electrician? I, you know, I, you don't need that. I do my style grow up. Three nails on the wall, just wrap wires around it. Whatever happened, happens, we'll just go with it. Because believe it or not, a large portions of boats out there have the exact attitude that a grow up has. You know what, I'm here, I wanna get it done. Something happens, we'll deal with that later. I just want electricity right now don't care about a short circuit, don't care about a fuse blowing, there's no need to think about it, I don't need one, I'm a lucky guy, it's just gonna work. 
All right, so what is a watt? And that's gonna be really important. So when you think about hot water tanks, a windlass, uh, a lot of devices on a, right? It's the actual rate of doing work. Yesterday I was using the word energy. Energy is stored. It's, it's what is doing work. Energy is storing power, right? <clears throat> so these are good little examples. A windlass, 1200 watts, that's a really good one. VHF radio, 25. Chart plotters nowadays are probably about the same, 25 watts. They used to be more, right? So, and all these values are gonna depend on what the voltage you feed to the device, right? So there's a big difference between and we'll talk about that, what happens when you run a device at 24 volts or you run it at 12 volts or you run it at 120 volts, right? That's gonna have an impact on the current draw. So, for in, in this instance, in the diagram, we've got a 60 watt light bulb. Sorry. And so if you've got 60 watts and you've got a 12 volt circuit, you're gonna have a five amp draw. Makes sense, right? So five amps is gonna flow through that wire. And there's this multimeter tool that I use, which is called a clamp-on multimeter. And big fan because it's something that you don't have to actually even use probes. You can just clamp on on any wire. You just literally wrap it around. It's almost like wrapping your fingers around a wire. And you can actually see the current draw that a load is giving you. And that's really useful for troubleshooting. Really useful. Because it's not scary. You're not disconnecting anything. You're not probing. And I want to know, is this device drawing any power? This point is very important, the second point. Amps vary widely based on voltage on the circuit. Running a windlass with an alternator is a good idea because your voltage is higher, therefore the amps are gonna be less on the circuit. But the opposite is also true and equally worse because now if you've got your batteries are depleted, 11, 11 and a half, and you're running the windlass with no alternator there, and you're running your windlass at 11 volts, what was good at 14 is now really bad at 11, right? So you always want to have the higher the volt within reason is better than a lower voltage. And that's what happens when you get to this low volt situation, things start dying, right? There are implications of what happens under low voltage that can be pretty serious, especially for motors. Okay, so here's a microwave. That's a common item on a lot of boats. Not everyone has a microwave, but it's pretty commonplace. If you've got a 1200 watt microwave and you're running it all over 120, you're gonna have a 10 amp draw. And you know what's so interesting? I get this all the time. Like, I'm talking, not every day, but almost. Jeff, you're telling me I'm gonna put in a 100 amp charger on my boat, but I only have a 30 amp receptacle on the dock. How will I run a 100 amp charger with a 30 amp receptacle? I can't, and I don't have a generator. What am I gonna do? It's maybe, it's probably my fault, right? What I should have said is we're gonna provide a 100 amp 12 volt charger, right? That's probably gonna draw around 15, 18 amps AC, right? I should have told them the whole story, right? Because the reality is that a load at 120 and a load at 12 is different. So you can have a lot of devices, like a charger is a really good example. It converts AC amps to DC amp. That conversion process is not free, right? It doesn't simply convert for free. So a charger is generally gonna run about 1.8 times. You'll actually, if you put a 100 amp charger on your boat, it's probably gonna draw, it should, you, the math, you think, well, it's only 10 amps, right? It's a factor of 12 to 120 is a factor of 10, but there's a, there's a conversion rate and that conversion is gonna draw you about 18 amps versus what you thought would be only 10 amps. 
Inverters are way better, newer inverters are way better at converting DC to AC, but chargers are pretty inefficient still. So if you've got a microwave, 1200 watt load, 120 volts, you got a 10 amp. So, you know, probably the circuit on which it's connected is going to be the standard plugs that we have in the wall, like at home, and that's going to be a 15 amp receptacle, right? 15 amp receptacle is going to easily be able to handle a 10 amp load. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. You rarely want to have, you'll definitely a lot of times going to have, the windless manufacturer is going to be very specific on to what they want as a circuit breaker. That circuit breaker, if they tell you they want 80 amps, they're not expecting 80 amps on that windless. They're saying at 80, you got to stop. They gave us a safety factor, right? They gave us some room. So it's not like the windlass is always, like for instance, this windlass is 100. The manufacturer would never tell us to use a 100 amp breaker on there. Never. Because it would nuisance trip all the time. Now, a lot of them are not going to be telling you what actually the windlass is doing. They're not even going to tell you what it, the amps is drawing. They're just going to give you specific instructions. Use this as a breaker on this windlass. Right? And they're in their department, manufacturing, they're going... That's enough within reason because the windings on the windlass cannot handle more than X. So put a thermal circuit breaker of X on the circuit. Now notice how this windlass is doing better when the voltage is higher in terms of a lower amp draw, right? That's why it's always good when you're running your windlass to make sure that your engine is running but not only that, to make sure that you've engaged the throttle enough so that your alternator excited and it's outputting something that is meaningful to recharge the battery. And if your batteries were really depleted, well, maybe you should leave the alternator run for 10, 15 minutes to bring the battery voltage higher so that when the windlass does run for one minute, two minutes, your amperages are less than they would be without the alternator running. So approximately how many amps would you get in an alternator if you just start your boat and you just idle it and you're pulling up your anchor? Yeah, if you have a stock alternator, it's like 10, 15 amps. As, what is a stock alternator output at idle? Well, 10, 15 amps, maybe. Stock alternator is 55 amps. If you have a vanilla alternator and you didn't order a high output one, you just have an alternator. Nobody ever sold you. Nobody ever gives you something that's amazing without telling you it's amazing. That's the rule. Nobody gives anything away. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's like if you got a high output alternator. Now, of course, if you bought a super insane boat and you bought a $4 million, $5 million Fleming that's 55 feet or something, yeah, you know that the owners went full stupid. The builders, yes. Okay, but there, everything's full stupid. They went everything what I would have done. But that's the exception, right? Everything else, if you have a stock alternator, it's 55 amps. Maybe you're lucky you got an 80. But they go much bigger than that. And they're internal regulated. We talked about that yesterday. So don't expect a lot. And especially at idle, it's a function of RPM, right? Our alternated output for most stock alternators are very low on low RPMs. But something is better than nothing. It's not to say that it's not a lot, that you shouldn't use it. Put all the chances on your side. Now here's another example, what happens when you run it at 24 volts. Notice how the amperage went down? That's pretty critical, and that's why builders are on the larger boats are going 24 volts. Because the distances are so long and they want to save on the wiring, and they're like, oh yeah, the complications of having 24 volts aren't that bad. I'm going to wire my boat 24 and then we'll put DC to DC converters or I'll put a small battery bank for only 12 volt loads. But the ideal boat eventually in the future would be definitely 24 volts. The, the bigger the voltage, the better it is. It's just there's not a lot of appliances that run at that voltage in the past, more and more so now. It's easier and easier to go to higher voltages. 
All right, so what is direct current? There's two things, right? We're using this word interchangeably, and this is gonna be important when you're troubleshooting. You're gonna be thinking, am I dealing with DC or AC, right? <clears throat> direct current, for the most part, like 99, 99% is gonna come from a battery on a boat. Some of you might have a 24 volt boat, and 12 volts come from the DC to DC converter, but that's very rare, very rare. Only some of us have those. For the most part, everything DC on a boat is generally coming from a battery. Some boats uh, even have 32 volt systems. Again, pretty rare, but they're out there. Solar panels output DC current, uh, alternators output DC current. We talked about wind generators output that, DC generators we talked about output DC. Obviously, an AC generator doesn't output DC. The primary use of an AC generator is to output AC current. We'll talk about what AC current is. And that's alternating current. <clears throat> the AC is what we see in our homes, right? I mean, that's what it is. It's ubiquitous. Um, you get it from shore power or running a generator, right? Or you can get it from an inverter. Right? An inverter will provide AC. So on your boat, there's really three only ways for you to generate AC. I mean, there's always exceptions, but like, you're connected to shore power, AC. You're running a generator, AC, an AC generator, or you've got an inverter, and you're creating AC from DC. But those are the three methods on how you're gonna get alternating current, power supply. And what are AC, yesterday I wanted to emphasize, what are AC loads on your boat? AC loads are outlets, right, those plug-ins. It might be a microwave, it might be a hot water tank, a battery charger is gonna have an AC input, could be an AC water maker, could be an AC garbage compactor, could be air conditioning. Some boats, a lot of boats actually come with air conditioning, we don't use them that much here, but. They'll come with air conditioning. Air conditioning is AC driven, right? All of those are sort of AC loads that you have on your boat. People that go offshore, I, we wire uh, dive comp compressors, AC dive compressors, right? Generally things that need a lot of power are gonna be driven by AC. Why? Because the voltage are better. They're 220, 120. That means the wiring size can be significantly less. And that's why large loads are generally driven by alternating current. All right. So, okay. We're going we're gonna to deal into a little bit of wiring, and after that we'll take a little bit of break, and then we're going to do into electronics. So we talked about how important working from safe, doing things the right way I am constantly surprised and amazed at the ability for people to innovate in the wrong ways on their boats. There's a common way that works for 99% of the world, but there's always an owner that is convinced that they know better than everyone else. I have rarely been impressed positively by someone who came up with something better than the rest of the world does it. There are very few people that will wire a boat better than what the code does in a unique way that no one else thought about. Very rare. Never, I have yet to encounter it. There is probably one of them out there, but that's an Edison. Like, that's someone that is out there completely on their own. The rest of us are looking at each other, peers, and we're like, oh, what are they doing? Oh yeah, that's a good idea, oh yeah. But they're all pros, they're not people that have wired a boat for the first time one time and are coming up with a better idea than someone that's wired about 10,000 times, right? The best golfers are not the people that play golf once in their life. They're the people that play golf every day. So I want to emphasize, and here's what's, here's what's good and here's what's bad. <clears throat> if you have a previous owner that is convinced that they know more than anyone else, you could be in a world of hurt where what appears to be what it looks like, in their mind was the exact opposite. I've been on boats where reds are blacks, blacks are reds. I've been on a boat where they actually decided that patterns are bad. You should always be on your toes. 
So we're going to wire red sometimes, black sometimes, and we're going to interchange. We're going to use AC wiring for DC, DC for AC. We're going to mix it up. Like, we'll, you'll never know. You'll always need to think. And I am not making this stuff up. I am not making it. So as an owner of a boat, A, you'll never do that because you're here and you're educating yourself. You're clearly not that person. But what you need to be careful about is what about the person before me that owned my boat? Were they that person? And if they are, then tread lightly, slowly, because nothing is what it seems. And that's why the code is important because it's a waste of time. I remember on my boat, I had to do that. There are things on my boat that were just amazing. It was craziness. And I was so frustrated at the beginning. I was like, why am I spending all this time repairing something that could have been done the right the first time and actually working on things to improve my boat as opposed to just fixing something that was done bad? Because there's a lot of work on a boat. Nobody ever has to worry and say, golly gee, I wish I had a task to do on my boat. If only I had something that was essential and pressing. I'm coming here to the boat and I've got nothing that I could potentially do. S heavy sarcasm. I mean, a boat is a list. If you get into it, it's, it's miles deep. It, you, could, you could go forever and you just prioritize the important ones. So my takeaway with standards is don't waste your time <coughs> redoing things that could have been done once right. Worry about the things that you can't influence that you'll have to repair and do those things frequently. The things that you don't, there's so much work on a boat. There is so much work. So do things to standards. ABYC standards E11. Do it right the first time. So this is going to be for troubleshooting very essential. I've seen this. Boats from the 70s that did not have an AC panel on their boat that was retrofitted, was retrofitted at the time with solid core copper wiring on their boat. It's called a world of hurt. A world of hurt. A boat, unlike a house, is a vibration prone environment. Now if your boat doesn't vibrate, congratulations, you have a houseboat and your boat never moves. So you have less problems. But if your boat actually moves because of engine or it goes in the seas and you're actually in seas, you're going to have vibration on your boat. That vibration will break those cores over time. They will. And that's why you absolutely want this sort of wire. It's a copper wire that's been tinned to offset corrosion, which causes resistance. And so you want that sort of wire on your boat. Now, these are different wire sizes, but you can buy marine grade AC wiring. Like for example, that's potentially 14.3. You can buy 14.3 cable marine or household. Completely different, but very essential that you have that wiring. Your builders are, I've never seen a builder built to this ever. Um, you might have welding cabling on your boat. A lot of builders did for reasons of cost. And it's realistic, it does happen, it does happen. But if you're doing something on your boat, know that that is a very short-term uh, gain for long-term pain. So when you're buying wiring, and if you have wiring that is welding cable, and you have problems of resistance on that circuit, don't be surprised, right? Because there's no tinning on the cable, and the cable over time will have more and more voltage drop under load, and it's gonna give you grief. Color codes, talked about that earlier. They're there for a reason. It's about predictability. It's about being on board and just jumping in, not having to think about every single wire, what it does. It creates a pattern, okay? Very important. Here's a list. I know it's, the list might be hard, but there's a common list of 12 volt wiring color codes. The slides are gonna be presentable. That would be something that you'd wanna to work towards. The big ones are DC is Positive is red. Now DC negative is yellow. Thank God. Good reason. So that's really essential. And then you've got other different codes. What, what do you guys do, Jeff, if you can't find like a yellow and a red stripe? 
Well, we, yeah, we rarely find that wires almost doesn't ever exist. You can almost never find that. No. Yeah, it's, we use, for DC wiring, negative, we use yellow. Period. Yeah, yes, good question. How does one tell the difference between AC hot, which is black, and DC negative, which on all of our, a lot of our boats is black? Now, I just want you to just think about how insane this is. One is deaf, and the other one is benign. It's ground, it's earth, it's life. They're both black cables, and one is death and the other one is life. So you need to do as an electrician, when you see a black cable on your boat, tread cautiously, right? Because you don't know what it is. In the past, size of wire would have given you at least a start of indication. It's pretty rare that you're gonna have two watt AC wiring, black wire in your boat. You're not gonna see a cable that's as big as, let's say, my finger, that's gonna run AC on a boat, right? Generally, a generator might be outputting a big generator, maybe four gauge AC, right? Black, four gauge. That's pretty much the threshold of reasonable, because you can run, like think about it, eight gauge runs 50 amps. So four gauge is a big gen. So generally, it's the big cables are probably DC if they're black. But then there's a world where they overlap. 10 gauge, eight gauge, 12 gauge, 14 gauge. That world is a world of, I don't know. And you gotta think about it. Now obviously if the wires run in a cable and it's three colors, it should be AC, right? Like green, white, black. But remember the MacGyvers that are all around us? The people that are going to a store and say, well, that's stupid. Why would I buy two reels of 14.2 and 14.3 when I can buy one reel of 14.3 and just wire everything 14.3 in my boat and I'll have spare cabling on my boat when I need it. Because sometimes I'll use it for DC, I'll use it for AC. And I'll remember that white is red, black is negative, but depends things on context. And oh, it's, it's no big deal. I'll remember that forever. And somehow I'll pass that information on to the next owner just by touch. And they'll know everything I know. Yeah. So I can tell you there are countless boats that are wired 14.3 AC cabling and they're running DC loads. And then that makes your world completely crazy. If you have a new boat or a boat that's factory made and nobody's touched it, congratulations. You don't have this problem. The problem only happens with previous owners. <laughs> People that simply are infused with knowledge. People that simply were born and they knew everything. And those people don't need to read anything about anything. So they just do it. And it makes distinguishing between AC and DC very, very hard. <clears throat> very hard. Polarity also matters. I cannot say how polarity matters. Polarity, for example, if you screw up the polarity on a solar panel, you will blow it up. Some solar panels are $1,800. That is an expensive mistake. A bilge pump, if you, a motor, a fan, if you reverse the polarity, it's going to run the other way. That matters. So polarity absolutely matters. Um, here are some examples for DC, right? This is, we never use black ever, ever, on DC wiring, ever. Why would I? Confuse people? I mean, I'm not mean. I want to make people's life easy. I use yellow. All the spools we buy are yellow for DC, every single one. Does that include battery cables? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the question was, do I do that with battery cables? Absolutely, two watt, four watt, three watt. All those DC wiring, large cable sizes, I use yellow. Here's uh, basically the common three colors for AC on a boat. Um, you also, on boats that have 220, you'll have also red. What? 
red can also be AC? Yeah, yes. So if you've got a 220 boat, you'll have red, black, white, and green on AC. And if it's a 220 boat, that means it's a big boat. If it's a big boat, that means you have a big generator. If you have a big generator, that means you have big red wiring. So now you've got big reds that are actually 220, and you have reds that are 12. Now, 220 would hurt. Like, now that's a real-life event. So this is where, when you're working on your boat, I would strongly suggest that you remove AC appliances or AC, low, AC sources of power when even you're working on your DC system, right? You want to remove any sort of possibility. Shut down the shore power, you know? Disable the dis inverter with the in inverter service disconnect. Make sure your generator won't start. And then do it, but do it <coughs> cautiously. Because remember, the implications about 120, it's not about pain, right? It's about death, right? You literally can get electrocuted. And it's not that you'll not, you'll be dead. It's not like you're going to have a big burn mark on your fingers or across, you know, if you arc it through your body, right? It's not like your fingers are gone. This is not like, it's not going to damage your body that bad. It's your heart. So that's why you need to worry about 120. It's this alternating current that screws up with your heart rhythm, okay? Different wire sizes, of course. This is non-metric, so the technicians that come to us from Australia that live in where things are actually normal and metric don't understand any of our wire sizes. <laughs> Naturally, I love this. It's only the British, only the British. They figured out that the largest cable size was gonna be zero. So they decided largest was gonna be zero. But then one time they realized, well, actually it's not. So I need a bigger one. So then they did one aught, two aught, three aught, four aught. Because if you set the largest cable to be the start, what is largest at a moment might not be largest forever. Smaller should have been the way they did it, which is how the metric system works. They go the smallest to whatever it is. They start from zero and build up. The imperial system does it the other way. They go from largest first, and then zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. As you go up bigger the number, the smaller the gauge. On a boat for troubleshooting electrical, electronics and stuff like that, appliances, you're gonna see wire gauges from here to about 22, this range here. 24, 26, 28 is so tiny, you can even, it's a hair, I mean, it's tiny. But 10 gauge, 14, 16, 18, those are kind of the common sizes for electronics. On electrical, you're gonna start being bigger cable sizes. Obviously, thicker wire, carry more amps. <clears throat> we, we emphasized yesterday how too small of a wire can cause a fire. And this is a wire that's catching on fire and it's actually probably just a micro shot because the amount of smoke that comes out of, and we saw that yesterday in the video, the amount of smoke that comes out of the jacket of a cable when it's dead short is absolutely terrifying. It is like a smoke grenade. You'll never see through it. Would there be any difference, same wire size, uh, 12 volt as opposed to 24 volt, like uh, dead short? In no, oh, same thing's going to happen. I mean, you, you're going to wire, a dead short's a dead short. The, the challenge is, is, are there differences between a 24 volt or a 12 volt dead short? There's more energy capacity in a 24 volt bank, but then the wire sizes also generally are going to be sized a little bit less, so there's maybe going to be less shielding that's going to, the problem is not the wire melting, it's the heat that's generated when the wire melts, because the wire will melt. It will actually, most likely actually melt away. You'll melt the metal apart. So can you imagine you're actually melting copper so it actually becomes a part? I mean, that's a lot of heat. But in the process, it's so warm that it warms everything around it. Like when we do, we do a lot of insurance claims <clears throat> where we come on board and, and then that bundle wire shorts the other wires around it because how many wires on your boat are running alone? Alone, in one conduit just by themselves. They're not. They're running down pipes, conduits, and when you have a dead short, even on a small wire, I've had that on a boat where you had a dead short from the bridge down to the lower helm on a small wire, I think it was a VHF cable, gauge 16. That short was going down the pipe that was connecting the two helms, 
Then it caused shorts on bigger cables, which caused short, and the whole bundle shorted. So it has a domino effect, right? Because the cable doesn't just lie on the ground all by itself on a completely, you know, concrete floor and it just shorts and you just lose it. It's not a fuse like you see in the movies when they blow up a bridge. Like you're blowing up a wire in a bundle and that bundle is not meant to sense a wire that's around it getting so hot that it's going to yield not only their jacket, but the jackets around it and then everything just goes. <clears throat> All right. So when, and that could be a problem on your boat when you're troubleshooting. And remember what I was saying a little bit yesterday, and I want to emphasize this. This is what I think is so, in some ways, terrifying of being a boat owner is that the realization that things on your boat are not necessarily done right, as opposed to your car. You know, when I started owning my boat, I thought, Jeff, what you're just going to do, if you don't understand something, you're just going to redo it the way it was done because it's probably done right to begin with. Just redo what's there and you're good to go. I can only tell you the downward spiral that I went into, this black hole, when I realized the things on my boat weren't done right in the first place and that's why things were not working. Now that is disconcerting because then where do you start? And this is how I got in this business. Literally, I didn't want to be in this business. I wanted, I was doing quite well having a normal life working a nine to five hour job, just dealing with other stuff and going home in the evening and boating. But I was like, this is crazy. Things have to work on a boat. And so when you're thinking and you're troubleshooting a problem on your boat and your bilge pump is constantly blowing or your water pumps are, not, are failing prematurely or why is my windlass being changed every two years or three years? Why my starter constantly dying? It might have to do that the wire feeding that device was undersized to begin with. So when you're troubleshooting something, don't assume the problem is only that device. Maybe the power feeding into that device was undersized to begin with and you're constantly having voltage drop and that voltage drop is causing the appliance to work harder than it should and it's causing it to die prematurely. This is a Blue Seas, um, and they did a good job because ABYC has a uh, table, but they've kind of married both a wire ampacity and voltage table together. And the voltage that you're trying to shoot for is either 10% or 3%. That's called voltage drop. And this is the length of the cable return, meaning what is going to be the cable going to someplace and back. Cannot tell you how many boaters are just always thinking, what's the distance between my batteries and the windlass? 20 feet, 30 feet. Okay, and then they go and they wire this. I'm like, no, no, that's half the circuit. It's 30 feet to, 30 feet back, it's a 60 foot run, right? And also think that the distance is the wire distance, not the distance if a laser was sent through all objects between here and there. Rarely will you ever have distances on boats can be absurd. Going from a battery to a windlass might be 30 feet if you were like a bee and you were able to fly through walls, but the run might be 45 feet, 48 feet just to go because you're going up, down, sideways, across, right? There's all these obstructions to get to the windlass. So that length of cable is here. And then you've got to decide, is this a non-critical load or a critical load? ABYC has all these distinctions between the two. And then once you know that, then you can start choosing what wire size you have. Notice 4 odd is over here. And then it goes all the way to gauge 16. So here's an example. If you've got an anchor light that's 5 amps at the top. Now obviously this is not an LED anchor light. This is a huge anchor light. But let's just keep five amps. Most of them are probably two to three, but let's assume it's five. So you got the length of the cable to the bottom of the mast, up the mast, back down, and back, back again, right? So you got 10 plus 40, and then another 40 plus 10 for a total of 100. Now this is also assuming like it's a straight line, right? 
Remember, very few things. There's, that's why people hide wires. You don't want to see wires in your boat. So everything's hiding behind walls, underneath. So the runs are not that clean. So if you've got a 100-foot run of cabling, and that's not crazy, right? That's not crazy. 40-foot high mass is a pretty low mass. They get much higher than that. What, where are you going to find that on the chart, right? So you go non-critical load, 30 feet, that would give you 12, right? <coughs> 100 feet, but we're not doing 30 here, right? We're doing this one. So it's a 12 gauge. And that's generally what they are. Even on my Catalina, I had that. They got that right. We talked yesterday, I'm going to go through this a little bit. A fuse, the purpose of a fuse, and when you're going to be troubleshooting, fuses are one of the number one things you're looking for, okay? If you don't know where a fuse for a circuit is, prepare yourself for a lot of frustration when you're troubleshooting something. If you have a power problem to an appliance, the most likely culprit is the fuse. Most likely culprit is the fuse. So you need to know where the fuses are so that you can actually replace the fuse so that you can get the appliance working again. Different example of fuses. These are kind of called ATO, ATCs, right? You see those in cars all the time. That's a glass fuse. That's what's called an ANL fuse. Testing fuses on the glass ones, it's actually sometimes hard. They're so hard. I mean, you know, you can actually, what you do is you take a multimeter and you put it in what's called Ohm's test, right? Or continuity test. And you'll actually measure across that. And before you actually measure continuity, you actually put the two probes together and you should hear a beep. That tells you that you're, you're in the Ohm's meter mode. You touch, you hear beep, that means you've got a dead short. That's what you're looking for, right? Because the fuse is supposed to provide connectivity. So when you put it at the end of the fuse, if you don't hear a beep, you know you have an open circuit. Therefore, the fuse has blown. Some fuses, like a class T fuse on an inverter, you can't see the filament inside. The only way to test a class T fuse is with a multimeter. Again, if you don't, if you never leave the dock, <clears throat> this doesn't matter. But if you do leave the dock and you go further and further afield, I cannot tell you how many times I have this conversation every day in the summer, helping other boaters figuring out why their inverter charger is not working. I mean, it's 20, 30, 40 times a, day, a week. Constantly, I get text messages at night, in the morning, oh my God, my inverter doesn't work, how do we resolve it? I've heard, can you help us? We don't know each other, but I heard you can help me. And I'm like, okay, let's walk through it. What's going on? Let's, where's your fuse? I don't know. Well, that's the first thing. You gotta start, chase the wire down. It's gonna be close to the inverter, I don't see it. Well, look at the positive wire, start chasing it down. Rule number one, create diagrams. Does it, you don't need it, remember, being prepared is about when things happen to resolve them expediently, right? So know where the fuse is. Okay, now you're going to shut off the switch. You have a switch? No. Okay, well, that's a problem. All right. So this is going to spark a little bit here, okay? So take out the fuse. All right, do you have a multimeter? No. Well, you need one. Go get one. I don't have one. See a friend. Find someone in the marina, some, someone in the anchorage. we got to find the ohms. Is it that, do you have a spare? No. Well, that's a problem. Carry spares. All these things. And the difference between the person that's prepared and the person that isn't is there's one person that spends a day, two days resolving a problem, and the other one takes literally 10 minutes. So it really depends as a boater is like, do I value my time? Really, that's what it comes down to. And being prepared and having a multimeter. And actually, before you put a fuse, just test it, just for the fun of it. You know, it's sort of like radar. I use radar when I don't need it so that when I need it, I know how to use it. Don't have your multimeter stacked so deep in your toolbox that you've never seen it before and the first day you use it, you don't even know if it has batteries or if it's powered. <clears throat> right? The problem, like I was trying to emphasize, is some fuses you cannot see the filament. And the filament is so small to begin with. I've seen glass fuses where the filament explodes, but it explodes perfectly on the glass. And the filament is right there, you're looking at it, but it actually didn't break in the middle, it broke at both ends and the filament almost etched itself on the glass. So when you look at the fuse, you're like, I still have a filament in there, but it's actually an optical effect. The filament is not there. The wire is so small within that, that it actually is an open circuit. So sometimes looking at something will not tell you the whole story. 
Yesterday we had questions about different types of fuses. This is the, the, the perfect slide. Again, Blue Seas does a great job at this. You can see all the different types of fuses here that are common for in the marina environment. Strongly suggest that as you go further and further afield, you start carrying spare fuses. Your goal should be for everything, but at least for the critical things on your boat, like an inverter charger. If that goes, you not only lose your inverter, which might mean you lose your refrigerator, which this could be a big deal, because that means you have all your food is going to thaw out. <clears throat> so have a spare Class T fuse on board. Some boaters, I give two. They're going up to the Browns. They'll never use them, but I'm like, at least, because if you need a fuse in the Browns, you're not going to get one. It's not going to happen. You're not going to go to Chez Pierre, walk in and go, hey, I'm looking for a Class T fuse 400. No way. There's no way. You're on your own. You're totally on your own. So this is a great chart. Blue Seas did a great job. They show the different ranges. We pretty much use every single fuse on there, every single one in our business. Fuses are built for a purpose. They all have different trip rates, um, different amperages. And yeah, they're, it's great. It's awesome. And even show all the wire gauge sizes. Whoever ever made this chart, it's awesome. Great job. Well, it depends. Like, for example, a really popular one that we love and we use quite a lot is this one here because it's easy to install, the MRBF. That's probably the most popular one that we use now. Marine rated battery fuse. That's probably the number one. It looks like a chiclet. It's about maybe one centimeter. You have some on your boat. I put, the, I mean, I buy these like in thousands. Like, like I'm crazy for fuses, right? Crazy for fuses. I fuse everything. Everything is fused. So is your house, though, by the way, right? Like, if you didn't fuse a circuit on your house, it's criminal negligence. Like, on the water, it's a choice. Oh, well, I didn't think I needed one. Because the code on land is have to do it. Regardless of who you are, there's someone that comes behind you to audit the work you did. But on a boat, it's recommended. It's the Wild West. It's the Western frontier. So that's why the craziness happens. In Australia, this is why I like uh, hiring Aussies, it's not land and water is the same. So over there, there is no craziness. All this time that I'm wasting talking about fuses, nobody would ever talk about it over there because they all do it the right way, right away. There is no option. You cannot not do it the proper way. But in Canada and the United States, it's seen as a voluntary recommendation. So the MRBF is probably the most popular. Inverters, we use this. And then ANLs, we use on large circuits a lot. <clears throat> Circuit breakers are very similar, right, to fuses, but they, op they offer most of them, and their thermal circuit, the ability to be reset or also to be turned off. So our AC panels and our DC panels are thermal circuit breakers that you turn on and off. Thermal circuit breakers will die. They don't work forever. They will at one point stop working. I see them. It's part of, and we'll talk about how you troubleshoot that, but they will die, right? <clears throat> but they're great because not only is it a fuse, it's a resettable fuse, and it's a switch. It's a way for a boater to say, I want to disconnect a circuit. All our panels are built with these, right? You don't see the back, but you see that just little toggle, white toggle, and you're turning on water pumps, radar. All those circuits are basically thermal circuit breakers that in the event of a short or overcurrent would actually trip. So they'll actually go on the off position in the event of overcurrent. Are there boxes that you can get or just one? Of yeah, things? yeah, yeah. Lucy's makes tons, yeah. Absolutely. The really popular one that you see a lot of times that you put on all pretty much inverter, on all uh, windlasses is those sort of fuses, right? Or circuit breakers, right? You've got to press the button, right? It resets if you want to close it. So for example, it's great because if you're passage making and you're a sailor and you're going to be sailing for 20 days between here and there, you might want to disable your windlass. Like why would your windlass be powered for 20 days in the bow of the boat that's going to be underwater? 
You might want to say, you know what, I'm not going to have power on my windless and on my windless solenoid. I don't want to have any accidental, not only is your anchor tied, but you don't want the motor to turn on for whatever reason. So you don't have necessarily a switch for the circuit. You have a thermal circuit breaker that you go and disable. So I remember when I sailed around Vancouver Island and I left Port Hardy and we were sailing around Cape Scott and I had heard horror stories. And by the way, for me, they were real. It was, a, it was an extremely humbling event. Before I did that passage, reading people that had done blue water, I'm like, well, this is sort of going to be my first blue water. There's probably going to be some green waves on the bow. Probably. That's what I heard. Not everyone has this experience. I certainly did. did. And so before I went, I'm like, I'm not planning on anchoring off Cape Scott. Not going to happen. <laughs> I'm like, we were there, a lot of us were good swimmers. I'm like, but the shoreline is far from inviting. So it's like, you can make it to shore, but you'll probably die landing on shore. I was like, no, we're not gonna be anchoring, so I disabled my windlass as I was doing that passage. And that's great, that's what's nice about a circuit breaker, right? You can actually turn devices off. So it's a fuse and it's a circuit breaker. All right, so with that, I'm gonna just ask any questions. We're gonna about take a break, and then we're gonna go into electronics. Any questions on wire sizes, circuit breakers, fundamentals, volts, DC, AC, anything. Like if you have, sorry. No, go ahead. If it uh, requires a, a 16 gauge, you put a 14 gauge, it's not going to make any difference. Question is, if something requires 16 gauge, does it hurt to have 14 gauge? Absolutely not. And I can tell you, as a boater and as a technician, when I wire my own boat, guess where an engineer goes? Does the minimum or errs on the side of caution? <laughs> my wire sizes are never to minimum. Never. Why? The cost is so tiny. The, the most expensive thing on your boat is time. Your time or another person's time. The labor cost is what is the biggest proportion. Run a wire run once, do it well, do it with slightly bigger gauge. I'm not saying if they need 16, go to watt, but how many times, I don't ever run 16. I don't even have 16 gauge. All our wires are the bigger size. So it's 14, 16, 14. 12, 10, 10. I'm always gonna go up a size. If I can fit it on the terminal, <coughs> give myself room. Why not? It's not a lot more money, and then just do it right, do it once. Question? Oh, I had a question about batteries. Um, I'm thinking of upgrading the house batteries. Can you say a few words about the Firefly batteries? I will do that. So the question was about Firefly batteries. We talked a lot about Firefly batteries yesterday. Oh, okay. I will take that offline and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Keep it on topic right now. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Can you recommend a bid multimeter? Yeah. Um, Oh, first multimeter, if you want to learn. <clears throat> I was so excited when I bought my boat. I was, it was a combination of, it was a life event. And I went to Home Depot, and I bought like 2,000 worth of dollars of tools. I thought it was justified. I was like, well, I have a boat now, so I need tools. And I went to Home Depot, and I bought a multimeter. All did it well, all right away. The multimeter is now on a shelf, and it's a reminder, and I keep it right there always to remind me that I need to educate myself before I buy something. That multimeter is only for AC. It doesn't do DC because at Home Depot, how many people worry about DC circuits? <laughs> so the lesson is educate yourself and I keep it. It's still there. People at the office are like, why do we have this here? It's to remind each and every one of us to educate ourselves before we purchase anything. All right. So you're gonna want a multimeter that is DC enabled. That's really gonna be the most of the troubleshooting that you're gonna do, do on your boat. You're gonna want a multimeter, and I'll bring one in, that is clamp on, right? It has a, like a sort of like a little spring-loaded jaw, and I'll bring it in, I have it in the car, um, where you can actually measure current on all these circuits without disconnecting, electrocuting yourself. It actually measures it through magnetic flux Right, so there's a magnetic field through every wire when current flows through it. It's just, that's part of it. And so you put that little clamp-on meter and you can actually measure, and I get 
owners that totally geek out with me. They're like, oh my God, I spend the whole weekend figuring out what my amp draws are. And they're measuring everything. Oh, my fridge draws this, my S bar's doing this, or my windlass draws that. Oh my God, my thruster's drawing so much. Or, and then they're creating lists and they're like, I had no idea. Because now suddenly you can actually know what each individual circuit on your boat is drawing. And that might sound a little bit geeky when you don't need to, but I can tell you when things are gonna actually fail, knowing how to use a clamp-on meter, and you might not know perfectly how to do all the steps, but if you know how to use the tool and you can have someone guide you remotely to solve a problem, that's gonna be really helpful. Again, it's all about staying on your vacation, staying on the water, not having to have someone come over to you. And I do fly technicians out, but it is expensive. You don't want that. You want to be self-reliant, right? Do everything you can to resolve a problem, and that multimeter would be really amazing. Blue Seas does a really good one, actually. You don't have to buy a Fluke. Fluke is sort of like the most, I don't know, the best, but on, my technicians will. Some of them will spend, one of my technicians bought himself for Christmas a $2,000 multimeter. But I mean, this thing has reporting, it has data logging, and I'm so envious. I'm trying to justify it to myself, but I don't work on the tools anymore, so I can't. But for most of us, you go on Amazon and you're probably gonna spend for a reasonable digital multimeter, not an analog one, never analog. Don't bother, it's a waste of time. Uh, probably $100, $200. Think about how expensive to have someone come and help you per hour versus having that. You'll pay that multimeter easily within the hour. And then you can have someone like myself or someone that works on your boat help you diagnose, diagnose a problem remotely. Right? Very helpful. Yes? How would a source for wires, fuses, connectors, that kind of thing locally? Where do you go to buy it? Well, we buy everything at bulk, crazy volume. So, um, retail. yeah, retail, um, well, there's not that many more chandleries, right? So I think you'd have to go to your chandlery. It's got to be a marine chandlery. So it would be... Like some owners, especially for sailboats, some, they'll come to us. Our prices are as competitive, but we're not a retail shop. You're not gonna be looking at spools. Like we've got a front end, but the back end is 95% of our business. There is no retail store in our business. Mm -hmm. But they'll come, they'll say, I need this and this. If you wanna have a retail experience, well in Vancouver, you're probably gonna end up going to Steveston. Um, West Marine went out, is no longer here. There's, uh, Martin Marine is awesome on the North Shore. Any other suggestions? I mean, uh, Wolf down in, uh, oh yeah, beside the Shelter Island. Yeah, he's great. Three or fourth generation business owner. Guy's awesome. <coughs> but it, it's, it's dwindling. It's dwindling. There's less and less channelries left around, right? Yeah. Okay, other questions? All right, we'll take a break and then we're gonna dive into electronics. <laughs>